So here's a predicament I know we've all been in. You're getting ready to host a Victorian-style soiree for all of your closest friends, and it turns out all you have is beer, sugar, and eggs. What do you do? Well, you make beer punch, of course, and that's what we're making today. We'll also talk about the infamous and quite literal London beer flood of 1814, this time on Drinking History. So there aren't that many beer cocktails around today. There are a few, but not that many, and frankly, I think that's probably for the best. But in his 1896 book, Fancy Drinks and Popular Beverages by The Only William, The Only William gives us a recipe for beer punch. Boil one quart of beer with one fourth of a pound of lump sugar and a stick of cinnamon. Beat four eggs into foam and mix it with a wine glass of old Jamaica rum. Take the beer from the fire and add it to the mixture while continually stirring it. Serve in punch glasses. Sounds kind of weird, but one of the very first episodes of Tasting History was a buttered beer from the 16th century which had butter and eggs in it, so maybe this is like a descendant. Anyway, for this recipe what you'll need is one quart or one liter of beer. Now the beer is really up to you. He's very specific in other recipes what beer to use. He's not in this one, so I figure pretty much anything is going to be fine. I'd probably use something like a, a darker ale, or I'm using a dark porter, because that ties into our history today. A heaping half cup, or about 115 grams of sugar. Now, I'm using an unrefined uh, raw sugar. You can also use regular sugar. It calls for lump sugar, which is less sweet than, than a regular granulated sugar, so I think that this is probably the way to go. One cinnamon stick, four eggs, I've already cracked mine, and two ounces of rum. Now he calls for an old Jamaica rum, which was a darker rum like this. This one is actually from Hawaii, but it'll work for this. I wouldn't use, well, no flavored rums and probably not a white rum for this either. So first go ahead and pour your beer into a pot or a saucepan. Then we're going to mix in the sugar using an adorable little Pikachu uh, spatula. And we'll also kind of mix it in Probably not going to dissolve very well at the beginning, but uh, once, it gets, once it gets heated up, it will. Throw in your cinnamon stick. Should add some good flavor. And then start heating it. We're going to bring it up to a simmer. Calls for a boil, but let's go a, a light boil, like a simmer. While that heats up, go ahead and whisk your eggs. You want to get them nice and foamy. They're not going to get too big, like if they were just egg whites, but they should get nice and foamy. It's just going to take you a while. It'll take a few minutes for them to get foamy, but the beer is going to take even longer to start to simmer. So, while I wait for that, let me tell you about this really crazy day in 1814. Our story begins, as so many do, in foggy old London town, on the corner of Tottenham Court Road and Oxford Street in an area then known as St. Giles Rookery. And frankly, it was not a very nice place. And it hadn't been since the 12th century when Queen Matilda opened St. Giles Hospital there, and it was used as a leper colony for centuries. By the 15th century, they had added gallows for executions, which oddly enough did not help real estate prices. And then in 1606, as if they needed to make it official, Parliament condemned the area as deep, foul, and dangerous. And in 1665, the Great Plague of London broke out in that neighborhood. Really, just, they just couldn't catch a break. Though there were times when it was a bit of a destination spot, seeing as it was on the route from Newgate Prison to the Gallows at Tyburn. And the condemned were often allowed to pop in one last time to an inn called the Angel. The clergy at the church next door would pay for them to have one last drink called a St. Giles Bowl. This was a neighborhood whose inhabitants were described by the writer Henry Mayhew as a noisy and riotous lot, fond of street brawls and fat, ragged, and saucy. Which coincidentally is the name of my exotic dance trio. Let's welcome to the stage, fat, ragged, and saucy. So naturally, this was the neighborhood that Henry Mew decided to invest in in 1809 when he bought the Horseshoe Brewery. And based on the neighborhood's track record, he could not have been that surprised at what happened just a few years later. See, Mew had built a 22-foot-high wooden vat capable of holding 18,000 barrels of porter, and it was held together by several massive 700-pound iron bands. Well, around 4.30 in the afternoon, on October 17, 1814, the storehouse clerk, George Crick, saw that one of the bands was slipping. And when he went to his supervisor to tell him about it, the supervisor just said, yeah, that, that happens sometimes. Go write a letter to one of the partners. They'll handle it when they have the time and money. 
Unfortunately, an hour later, standing only 30 feet away from the vat, probably with that little letter in his hand, the vat burst. A torrent of porter ripped through the facility, knocking over other vats, releasing an estimated 320,000 gallons of beer. The wave of which knocked down the 25-foot wall at the back of the brewery, sending a 15-foot wave of beer into the streets of London. And the first casualty was when that wall fell on 14-year-old Eleanor Cooper as she was washing pots outside of the Tavistock Arms, where she worked. The wave moved on to destroy several houses, in one of which Hannah Banfield, a four-year-old, and her mother were having tea and swept Hannah into the street, killing her almost instantly. In another house, people were holding an Irish wake for a two-year-old boy who had just passed away, and the beer came in and killed all of the mourners. As there were no drains in the street, the cellars and the buildings surrounding the street filled up with porter, nearly drowning some and injuring many others, and in total, eight people died. In the aftermath, the Morning Post said that it was a scene of desolation that presents a most awful and terrific appearance, equal to that which fire or earthquake may be supposed to occasion. Now, the press at the time made no mention of drunken riots or people going out into the streets filling up their cups with beer. But, due to an anti-Irish sentiment in the city at the time, and this was a very Irish neighborhood, those stories began to crop up in the following weeks. But there's no reason to think that it actually happened because the fact that it didn't appear in any of the papers, which weren't terribly pro-Irish either. What also didn't happen was any kind of accountability for the brewery itself, as an inquest reached the verdict that it had been an act of God and the eight people who had lost their lives had done so casually, accidentally, and by misfortune. Instead of paying restitution to the victims, Parliament decided that Mew and Company didn't have to pay excise tax on the beer that they had lost, saving the company from any kind of bankruptcy. Nothing went to the families. It's good to see that some things just never change. One good thing that did come from the incident was that they phased out the use of those big wooden vats, replacing them mostly with concrete vats. Now, oddly enough, this is not the only alcohol flood in history. There are several others that uh, I won't be talking about today, but will definitely be making appearances in future Drinking History videos. As for our beer punch, this is starting to simmer, so I'm going to finish up the eggs so we can try this out. Now, once your eggs are nice and frothy, go ahead and add two ounces, or about 60 milliliters, of that rum, and then beat that in. Now, I could probably do this all in this little bowl, but he says to serve it in punch glasses, so I'm going to mix it in this punch bowl very carefully. Take this out. So as you can see, the eggs nice and frothy, and very slowly, stirring the entire time, you're going to add the beer to the eggs. Stirring the entire time, very, very slowly. You don't want scrambled eggs. Just a little bit at a time. If you pour it all in there at once, you're going to end up with little pieces of scrambled egg in your punch, and nobody wants that. Uh, a lot of people who made the butter beer, uh, that's what they ended up with. And it's probably because I wasn't terribly specific uh, in those early days with how slowly you had to do it. I, I can't remember, honestly, but uh, go slow. And there we are. That's our beer punch. Let's give it a taste. As I said, he says to serve it in a uh, punch glass. You could use it and put it in like a mug or anything. Just make sure that it, since it's hot, it's something with a handle. It's so frothy, which, which I like. So, <laughs> I have to say, it's August when I'm recording this, the end of August, and it's like 90 degrees out. Not sure why I chose something hot beer to, to drink, but I did, so here we go. Hmm. It's weird. It's good though. It's like, there's a creaminess. It's not an egginess. There's a creaminess to it. You can, you can smell just a hint maybe of the egg. 
but it's more of the cinnamon. You get more of that cinnamon. Though I think this would be really good with even more spices in it. Add maybe some nutmeg or, or cardamom, maybe a little bit of clove, uh, or just more cinnamon. Also, I think a big, a big thing with this is what kind of beer you end up using because that's, the, that's of course the dominant flavor, that's the main ingredient. So using something like this works, a porter, I think like a chocolate stout or, or a vanilla flavored darker beer would be really, really nice. I'd probably steer away from something on the lighter side, like don't use a, a lager or pilsner or anything like that. But anyway, that's our beer punch and it's perfect for the holidays which are kind of coming up. So maybe hold off on making this one for a couple months, but eventually I think it's worth it. So make sure to follow me on Instagram, Tasting History with Max Miller, and I will see you next time on Drinking History. Now I need Christmas carols. It's August.